Hello, everybody. It is Sunday night here in Bangkok, and for the first time ever, I missed my own time. Thank you guys for for still being waiting in the room 20 minutes later. That was completely my fault, but we're here and we're ready to have a good time. I hope you guys are ready to party with us. Uh, so today we're going to be talking to John Bradshaw. I'm very excited about that. I've been thinking about having him here for a while because I know he's got some interesting specialties that we haven't really covered. Um, and as we said last month, we have been doing this for a while now. One, two, three, four, five, ten, uh, 14 months of gem cutting conversation. So if you haven't seen all these or if you, maybe you weren't uh, even aware that this was going on for the last 14 months, these are all up on YouTube. You can go back and check them out. I've been talking to gem cutters from countries all over the world with all different specialties and uh, all different interesting stories. And I'm sure that tonight's talk with John will be uh, a beautiful and uh, interesting addition to this library of gem cutting conversations. So John, if you're ready, come on in and we will get the party started. And here I am. There you are. Thanks for reminding me that we were uh, doing a webinar tonight. I almost, I almost missed my own party. How's it going? <laughs> That's okay. Oh, not too bad for Sunday morning. Yeah. For, for yeah, for me it's a Sunday night, so I was thinking right. about all kinds of other stuff. <laughs> so, where are you coming from? Where are you at right now? I am in uh, New Hampshire, uh, just about an hour or so north of Boston. Okay. Right. East Coast. And how's how's life out there right now? Uh, not too bad. The weather has certainly taken a turn. It is uh, getting to be on the chilly side. I take a walk every morning, four and a half, five miles or so. Oh, wow. And uh, when it gets down to 50 in Fahrenheit, um, I can still wear shorts. And it was right on the cusp this morning. Jeez. Okay. So you're you're braving the elements. There you go. It's a good way Winter to stay alive though right exactly yeah exactly so i guess give us a little bit of intro i i, I know i've met you several times in the tucson show um and maybe once or twice here or there but for our guests watching if they haven't met you before or they don't know about you can you give us a little bit of idea about who you are and how you came to be at this moment in time <laughs> uh, sure. Well, um, I am a uh, gem cutter, a gemologist, and a wholesale gem dealer, a member of a AGTA. Um, I've been cutting now for a little over 40 years. I started in 1979 wow. cutting, uh, although my first love, uh, as far back as I remember, was in minerals and rocks, basically. Uh, my parents had a, um, a cottage on a lake up northern New Hampshire. And as far back as I can remember, uh, I would take rocks home from the bottom of the lake and my mother threw them out as fast as I brought them home. <laughs> um, but uh, always loved them. Uh, my godmother's best friend's husband was a geologist. And we used to go to Tony's house uh, quite frequently. And Tony traveled the world quite, quite a bit. And, Anytime he went somewhere, he'd bring me back a rock or a mineral from where he was. And so I always was looking forward to going to Tony's house, to go downstairs into his lab and, and see what he had this time. Uh, so my, my love for minerals and rocks goes back a long time. And it wasn't until, I don't know, I guess I got old enough to, um, to subscribe to the magazine Rock and Gem, more for the rock part, really, than the gem part. But the more I got the magazine, the more I started reading about the gem part and started to take an interest in that. When I graduated from college back in 79, my parents bought me my first cutting machine. It was a Graves, uh, left-handed Graves. Oh, cool. And I know that left-handed cutters are not necessarily all that common, but it's how I learned. I do everything else right-handed except make my living. <laughs> okay, so you're right-handed, so, but you're cutting on a left-handed. Yeah. Interesting, yeah. okay. Yeah. So after the Graves, I kind of graduated to my first facet uh, that was one of the, when Phil Bean still had it out in Seattle. And uh, uh, that was such a, such an improvement uh, and an upgrade from what I had started with. And, but it was, I had to get a left-handed machine. So it was a special order because <laughs> most of them were right-handed machines. Okay. Um, and still cutting now on a left-handed facet. 
Well, I've always thought I'm, I'm left-handed and I've always cut on a right-handed machine, huh. but I, I kind of think it makes sense this way. I think the whole fasting machine industry is backwards because if you, for me as a left-hander, if I'm using the mast in my right hand, I can write down or use my loop with my left hand, which is what I want to do. And same exactly. for you, you have a free hand for writing. Whereas if your left hand was free, it's probably not going to do too much. Definitely exactly. not going to write anything down. Right. Exactly. So, yeah, exactly. So maybe it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So cutting began uh, a long, long time ago and cutting certainly uh, has come a long way in the last 40 years. Yes. Uh, the internet really didn't exist 40 years ago to speak of uh, for us common folk anyway. Yeah. So um, 79. So just, I think you're the, you're the only person I've talked to so far in America who was cutting at that point. Can you just give us a brief idea about what the community was like at that time? Like there was already faceting competitions and gym shows, of course, but was it, was there more people or less people in the, in the community at that time? The American community, I mean, um, you know, it was hard to know because there was no um, there was no Facebook, Instagram, there was no communication that way. So, yes, they were out there. But I think uh, for sure there were certainly much, much less than it is today. Okay. And, you know, of course, all of the um, uh, the Facebook groups and Instagram groups uh, of, of cutters now uh, certainly didn't exist back at that time. Yeah. Uh, I remember I met, uh, I traveled to uh, Rochester, New York. There's a mineral symposium there every, I think, April. And uh, I went to the symposium and I rounded the corner. There were a number of displays there. And uh, Art Grant, who I met that at that particular show, um, he had a display of rare stones and regular stones. And I, you know, it just, it just, it changed my world. I mean, I, it just, my, my jaw dropped to the floor. I couldn't believe what was in the case. Um, I could still see that case if I closed my eyes. <laughs> um, and we we met at that show, became quickly became very good friends, and um, shortly thereafter, business partners. And then he was even the best man at my wedding many years wow. later. So at that time, then you were you were cutting just ju normal jewelry style types of stones. Yeah, back in the uh, early 80s, I was still cutting, you know, quartzes and garnets and, and tourmalines and topazes and what have you. Okay. Uh, nothing, nothing exotic, really. And, th and did you just teach yourself or were you part of a lapidary club or had a mentor or anything like that? Uh, nope, pretty much. It was just kind of a lot of trial and trial and error and uh, a little bit of reading for what was available for reading, which at back at the time were really just books. There were, there were no, yeah. you know, articles online. So uh, Rock and Gem, Lapidary Journal, yeah, uh, you know, from time to time would have articles about cutting or gemstones. And of course, um, any of the Vargas books, the Sankankas books, uh, you know, had had information about cutting and what have you. So it was a little bit of reading and a little bit of, and a lot of bit of trial and error. Yeah, cool. So that's, I guess that's kind of the, the, the old fashioned way, either you would be in a lapidary club or you would just get the books and and just figure it out. Right. Yeah. I And, and to this day, I, I don't know if there are any lapidary clubs in my area anyway. Um, okay. You know, I know a lot of cutters and but I don't think that there's any organized, you know, club or group in yeah. in, in, in my area anyway. Yeah. OK, so you met Art Grant. So then what you guys became business partners he was the best man what was yeah well he he the one of the first things he convinced me to do was he says you have to go to tucson you have to go to tucson so okay so he said listen he says it won't cost you anything he says you can stay in the room with me um he says i'll take you around introduce you to, to you know to people in the industry and what have you and back at that time you know now in tucson you know tucson there are what i don't know 40 50 plus separate shows in town yeah uh back then uh, i guess there were maybe six <laughs> okay and they were pretty much all mostly right along the uh right along the freeway uh okay. the desert inn was kind of the first hotel that the uh the uh overflow from the tucson gem and mineral show dealers went and uh that's pretty much where we were set up um, you know, in succeeding years, but Art took me around and introduced me to, 
you know, Fred Poe, Johnson Kankas, Paul Desatels, all, all the, all the guys that I, you know, certainly had wow. read their books and seen, but, and to meet them, I was kind of blown away. Wow. So um, this is like the, this, you, maybe someone might call this like the golden era when all, the Vargas's could, could be accessible. St. Kankas could be accessible. Um, yeah. Geez, like all the people that we read now that we you you got a chance to even mingle with them a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Even even um, in succeeding years, we used to go down to visit uh, Dr. Gublin in Switzerland. Yeah. And a tremendous gentleman, um, great guy, always very accommodating uh, and, a, and a tremendous gemologist as well. Wow. So that's I don't know. It's hard to say now. Is, do you think if, if you could compare if for someone who came up now in the sort of with the the accessibility that we have with all these social media groups and youtube and you know all, alternative ways of learning was it better at that time because there were some really serious kind of like season cutters that you could potentially talk to or is do you think it's better now that you can sort of have instant access with a lot of people who may or may not know a lot about cutting like if you were a beginner um, again yeah you know i don't uh, uh, th there certainly are more people now that you can talk to but the i think the one thing that hasn't changed over that many years is that i as as far as i know most cutters are more than willing to to lend a hand and help another cutter uh get by to, to, to do something uh do they have some you know secrets that they that they hold excuse me close to their vest absolutely but you know for the most part uh, I, I think most cutters are more than willing to to share information and, and, and help another cutter. Yeah. Um, you know, back in the day, uh, this, in the early 80s, I, I was by myself. In the first few years, we were set up at the Desert Inn, and I would be in one room, and Art would be in another room, and Mike Gray, uh, another partner in Coast to Coast, he was set up in a third room. And... Uh, a customer would come into my room and look for a particular type of stone. I said, oh, I don't have that, but I think Art has it, or I think Mike has it. And so we were sending customers, you know, all over the place. And so one night, the three of us were out to dinner, and we said, you know, why are we sending customers all over the place? Why don't we form a comp and kind of do this all in one room? And everybody thought that was a great idea. And it was, well, don't we need a name? And I was on the East Coast, Mike was on the West Coast, and Art was in the middle, so he became two. So it was <laughs> coast to coast. And the uh, the first uh, the first showing of coast to coast rare stones was in Denver, 1987. So okay. going back quite a few years. Yeah. And the, I mean, the coast to coast crew has changed uh, over the years. Certainly, uh, I'm still in it. Obviously, Mike is still in it. Art sadly passed away uh, six years ago, um, but Art's daughter was in it with us for a little while. And then in the mid 1990s, Brad Wilson from up in uh, Kingston, uh, Ontario, uh, joined the group as well. So um, the three of us are still going strong right now. Wow, so cool. And so the focus of, you, of your trio uh, or the various trios was always about rare minerals and and unusual gems is that is that correct yeah i mean in the first in the first few years of tucson you know i would go to tucson with um with savorite with tourmaline with garnets and topazes and what have you and i'd have the stray fluorite or scapolite or something um and as the time went on we realized that you know selling selling sapphire or tourmaline in Tucson became more difficult when the Sri Lankans and the Brazilians were there. And so we kind of ended up kind of focusing more on the on the rare stones. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, primarily it was almost all, now, now in Tucson, all the sapphire, the tourmaline, the barrels, the garnets, the zircons, they all stay home and we only do the rarities. Yeah. So this is kind of interesting because it's it's pretty unusual to I mean, obviously, every cutter who's going to be professional needs to have some sort of a niche. But that's an unusual niche, right? Like, yeah. you're, you're, yeah. you're giving yourself a I mean, it's good because nobody else is doing it. But, uh, you know, in my small experience of cutting rare stones, it's a it's it can be a nightmare, right? Oh, yeah, there there's still some some the, the language around here gets colorful some days for sure. <laughs> Um, you know, it doesn't matter how long, 
that you've been cutting, you, you, you know, if you're a good cutter, you'll, you'll continually learn and try something different. Uh, just talking to Brad Wilson the other day on the phone and we were talking about uh, wax laps and he said, yeah, he says, you know, he says, I still use my wax lap as I do. Uh, Cause every now and again, you know, you're polishing with one of the newfangled polishing laps and one face just doesn't want to behave. Mm -hmm. And so you, you go to your tried and true wax lap and boom, it's polished. Wow. So is I've only heard about wax laps, but never ever met anyone that uses them. Is it just a phonograph record or is it some homemade thing? Uh, they so uh, it, the most of them are, are homemade or, or they were commercially made for a small amount of time. There was a, um, a guy, I forget his name now. Uh, he was in the Seattle Faceters Club up in the Northwest. Mm -hmm. um, and he made a great, he made two wax laps different. See, wax laps can be different hardnesses. And I have, I don't know, maybe five, six, seven different hardnesses, wax laps, okay. um, depending on what I want to do with it. And um, uh, I've made my own, usually with a combination of beeswax and carnauba wax. Um, okay. But yeah, it the, the wax laps are really kind of, it, it's, it's funny now because I don't think anybody makes them anymore. In fact, if you if you Google wax laps, you'll get a lot of response for wax lips. <laughs> <laughs> so, OK, I'm imagining the beeswax. I've made a beeswax disc before, but it was like super, super soft. Like, I don't think you could use that alone to do anything. No. So the carnauba yeah, wax is giving it some strength. Yeah. Yeah. And some hardness. Yeah. So you can you can vary the proportion of carnauba and and beeswax to get various hardnesses of wax oh, okay so then you, and you're just doing this like in the oven then basically right you heat it up to yeah. liquid and yeah. put yeah. it in a pie pan or something like that or whatever some mold yeah, or, or an old lap but you can you know if you turn over some of the old laps they're ribbed in the back so you can oh. you know uh cut those ribs out and then use that as a as a base for the wax cool so that okay so let, let's um I don't want to go too far yet because there's some interesting thing here. Were you already interested in rare stones or this was an idea when you met art? Um, well, I, I always, as I mentioned, uh, you know, minerals were always an interest to me. And um, when I saw the case that art had put in in Rochester, that really kind of, you know, pushed it up the line some for sure. Uh, now, you know, back in the day in Tucson, uh, it wasn't difficult to go around and find a broken rhodochrosite uh, specimen that, you know, a dealer had setting up his booth that morning and tipped over a piece and cracked it. And, oh, now he can't sell it as a, as a specimen, yeah. but it was still a good piece of rough. And, you know, that, that ship has sailed for the, for the most part. <laughs> you rarely can do that anymore. Occasionally you can pick up a piece here and there, but it's, it's rare. Yeah. So you must, but you've been collecting now for years and years and years. So hopefully oh, yeah, yeah. you've got, a, yeah, you know, I had that, I had that little rough buying disease since I started. So, you know, if, when I, when I saw something and I had enough money in my pocket, or knew that I could pay for it shortly. Uh, I would, I would buy it for sure. And, you know, as, as years went on, you know, often I kick myself uh, walking away from a deal saying, geez, why did I buy that? I didn't need that much more rough, but you know, what I've what I became to realize, and this was a lesson that I learned actually long ago, uh, in the early days of doing the Munich show. Um, I remember, you know, I didn't have much money at the time, and I was a little careful of what I bought, and I always did quite well with rhodochrosite. And uh, I didn't this one particular year. I didn't quite have enough money to buy the rhodochrosite that was for sale at the Munich show. And I said, well, no big deal. I'll get it next year. Well, next year I went to the show and lo and behold, there was not a single piece of rough available. And so that's kind of when I learned that, you know, these things aren't continuously available yeah. and you really have to buy it when it's available, not when you need it, because when you need it, it won't be available. Yeah. 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 It's true. And yeah. So I guess, I mean, I guess it's never, if you're buying quality rough, it's probably never a bad idea because it's always going to retain some value unless you're just buying cheap stuff that is is always so common but 
um and then but i i imagine in the case of rare gems like well they're rare they're they were never abundant never will be abundant so sometimes yeah. you just you can maybe you can only find it once or or whatever and then that's it and like your yeah. pro site it so okay that's a good well that's a good lesson for all of us but yeah yeah you have to buy above a certain level right you shouldn't you shouldn't just hoard cheap amethyst because that's probably not going to run out yeah you i mean yeah i mean right now for the, for the most part you can you know common things you can pretty much find available um you know amethyst citrine blue topaz um gar well garnets are quite available now if you think about it for what's coming out of east africa mm -hmm. um will that last forever no um but f at the time now yeah so the, the garnets that are come out of, coming out of east africa if you can buy some and hold on to them it's not they're not going to go down in price yeah yeah so you started the company but you also do you all you always had your own company as well though right yeah. you weren't always just doing rare right stones. i mean right now still um even though there are two companies john j bradshaw and coast to coast rare stones uh the three of us in coast to coast have our own businesses but we come together as coast to coast okay so then how did you actually make the transition into becoming a pro cutter like what were you doing before that en enabled you to kind of have the training wheels for a while um, well, my first, so I mentioned Tony Mariano, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the geologist that we used to go visit when I was just a young boy and, um, he was a geologist and, and he, uh, you know, as I was going through my high school years, um, he lost his job and, uh, I was gonna, I was gonna completely, you know, major in geology and go from there. And when I heard that he lost his job, I, kind of like geez if he lost his job what are the chances that i'm going to get a job <laughs> so i kind of majored in the next best thing chemistry okay and uh come to find out many years later he he lost his job because he left his job because he wanted to work for himself and that was that was foreign to me back in the day uh so anyway i worked as a chemist okay um for probably graduated in 79 i probably worked for three years as a chemist so i'd work full time during the day and then i'd come home and i'd cut at night Okay. So you were kind of a hobby cutter at the beginning. Definitely. Yeah. Did you, when you were doing that for those three years, did you have an idea that you'd become like a full-time cutter or you were working up to that? Well, I certainly had hoped so. Um, and so after I finished my um, degree in chemistry and was working as a chemist, um, I also, during that three-year period, uh, I also went back to take some geology classes to, to kind of fill some holes in my mineralogy knowledge. And then also did the GIA program too. Okay. So, so you were, uh, you were focused on that. Yeah. 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 I mean, I had always hoped that I certainly was going to end up working for myself. Didn't know how I was going to go, but I figured, you know what, I'm early enough. I'm young enough. If, if it doesn't work, I'll get another job. Okay. So, so chemistry was really just kind of a backup because you needed yeah. a, you needed to finish school and have a major. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But okay. you know what? I mean, in the long run, uh, my chemistry background certainly has come in very handy in what I do yeah. now. That's definitely a useful skill for, you know, like a potential future gemologist. That's one of the kinds of degrees that you can have and get hired in a lab. So yeah, I guess if sure. you wanted to change uh, directions now, you could maybe uh, go work for a lab or something like that if you wanted to. But that's you know, cool. I've been working. I've been working for myself for so long. I think I'm pretty much unemployable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm starting to feel that way as well. I know what you mean. Um, so, okay. So you you pretty much had the bug. You had you had had it. What as soon as you started the facet the first time, or or when did it? When did it? When did you have that life changing moment where you where you were gonna not do the normal thing anymore, or was it always well, gonna I, be like that? I think I, I think I always had in the back of my mind that that's what I wanted to do. And uh, yeah, it was just at, at one point, I just had to, you know, cut the strings and, and take a leap of faith that it was going to work. Yeah. And, uh, you know, fortunately, I had, uh, uh, I had so much work in the beginning that I that I certainly uh, was able to do that. I was I was cutting not only my own material, but I was cutting for other people at the time, too. Mm -hmm. Because, as I mentioned, there were really a lot of cutters. Uh, around this area you know the boston area is a pretty big area but there weren't a lot of cutters uh in the area at that particular time so there was plenty of work okay and um had you been 
to shows at that point before you went to that Tucson show? Did you know about like the trade or were you just in your own bubble of cutting random stuff? Yeah, I was pretty much in my own bubble. I mean, there were some local shows uh, in and around New England that I would go to. Uh, they were small little, you know, local shows. But at the time, they were pretty big shows to me. Um, the first big show, of course, was Tucson that I went to. And then um, uh, back in the day, Art also dragged me to the Detroit show a couple of times. And, uh, you know, so from there, I started to do a little bit more, uh, you know, knowledge and knowing people in the industry from various parts of the world uh, at various shows that they set up. So yeah. little, by, little by little, it was all a learning process. So, so I'm curious. I know I remember very distinctly the first time I was introduced to the trade via a trade show in California. And before that, I had no idea that there was even such thing as the gym trade. And when I first went to that show, it, it was like mind blowing. I was like, I just stepped into an alternate reality where the normal rules of business and life are totally upside down. Was that like that for you as well? Like, even though you loved minerals, when you saw that world, was it just like, this is crazy? <laughs> Oh, yeah. I mean, it was like it was like a kid in a candy store, really. Um, you know, to some extent, I was kind of used to it a little bit because I had been around minerals for a good part of my life. Okay. Um, so th that part wasn't oh wow. But the fact that so many dealers were set up all in one place with so much stuff to look at uh, and, you know, pennies in your pocket, um, uh, it, it was overwhelming, really, for sure. Okay. Yeah. But but I probably for you, the same as me seeing that just pushed it to the next level like you realize that there's so much more potential yeah. uh than just one man in his fasting machine in his house like there's a whole network so there's then, a whole world out there yeah so then okay talk to us a little bit now so you're you're a gem cutter but you i know you have many many hats and many facets to your 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 business so what is it what has it evolved into since 1979 uh well so now my my year is very kind of somewhat structured my cutting uh, i don't cut 12 months out of the year it's a combination of um traveling buying trips and selling trips to do shows uh this past month i did um agta with in vegas and then agta in denver uh, I attended uh, the, in fact, when we were going to set this little uh, meeting up between us or for this uh, webinar uh, back in October, I was giving a talk on faceting in, in Dallas. Okay. So uh, it, it, the, the travel part has, has definitely increased for sure. Okay. Um, so my cutting now, so we're in October now, I'm on the road in and out of stores, um, you know, selling for the Christmas season uh now through probably the end of october and then my christmas season outside of emergency calls is pretty much over so on november 1st or in and around there i'll chain myself to the cutting bench and start cutting for the rare stones for tucson wow and then of course tucson happens and that's the um you know after tucson's over it's a big you know uh big relaxation time so i usually my wife and i usually take a couple of weeks and we go down to um Costa Rica for the last probably seven or eight nine years now cool. and just kind of just completely kind of yeah. uh, recharge the batteries and then I'm back at the cutting wheel in March I cut for a couple of months to get back out on the road in the spring for late April May and June and then I cut again over the summer July and August to get back on the road for September and October wow. so it kind of shifts back and forth it's it's very organized though like you 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 obviously have done this over and over again to yeah internalize yeah. that system so so you're a traveling salesman at some points you're a gem cutter at some points you are doing show vending at some points and then there's also buying trips so what are the buying trips about are you going to other countries or just meeting dealers around america yeah, well, uh, one of the one of the trips that I make sure that I make for sure every year, except this past year, um, is Sri Lanka. Um, I, uh, the you know um, I've been working with uh, a lot of friends in Sri Lanka for many many years, and uh, I still make sure that I get there at least once a year. Um, what I realized too is that rather than traveling to each and every country that gemstones come from, it makes a whole heck of a lot more sense 
to attend some of the major trade shows that are in around the world. And that way you can see Sri Lankans, Brazilians, Africans, you know, all kind of under one roof. Yeah. So um, for many years, I did the Hong Kong show, the Munich show, um, Tucson, of course, mm -hmm. my annual trip to Sri Lanka and, you know, a few stray trips here and there. Okay. So then when you're doing the Tucson show, then do you have some days dedicated for buying and some dedicated for selling or is it just, or are you selling every day and buying at night? Yeah. You know, it, uh, I can, I, I, we've been doing Tucson now for again, 40 years or so. And I can, you can mention any day in that two and a half week stretch that I'm in Tucson and I can tell you exactly where I'll be and what I'll be doing. Oh, wow. Um, you know, the first, so what happens is we, uh, Mike Gray and Brad Wilson and I, um, we all arrived to town roughly a week or so before uh, the show opens. And we, we kind of sequester ourselves in the hotel room for about three days because we have to take those three inventories and meld it into one to make sure right. that, you know, the pricing is all in line and makes sense and everything is you know done and ready for the show and that takes a few days okay and we've been doing that for quite some time and then we have a um, a couple of days to see some private clients and a couple of days to to actually get out and see some of the other shows because once we open up uh at gjx i mean we're we're anchored there until yeah. the end yeah okay and those are those are long tiring days so you probably don't want to be shopping at night you're going to be fatigued and right, right. Right. Well, it's changed too. I mean, you know, now when six o'clock hits, uh, almost every show closes down, right? I mean, certainly the, you know, GGX and AGTA and yeah. uh, most of the major shows. But back in the day, back in the early 80s, uh, when the Desert Inn, which is no longer even a building, uh, was up and running, uh, rooms were open until 12 o'clock, one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning <laughs> every day. Wow. And that, yeah, that doesn't happen anymore. That's like a totally different kind of an atmosphere at that point. You're, yeah. you're kind of, you know, half party, half days, half buying mode. You wake up yep. in the morning, you don't know what you bought, maybe. <laughs> it's happened, yes. <laughs> well, I guess, it, yeah, it could be interesting. Yeah, that sounds fun anyway, though. But maybe a little bit. I mean, Tucson already, even now, is like stressful and tiring and even even just as a buyer it's fatiguing to just do yeah. that even for five days so and i know being in the booth is double doubly because you're talking to a million people and it's draining and you know and everybody wants to say hi too so right, right. okay so i'm just imagining you as a chemist in the early 80s who doesn't who knows about minerals but you hadn't perfect you know traveled around at that point for gem buying and stuff yet right like how did you how did you even figure out like how to do that well my first my first international trip was actually with tony mariano the the my my boy his, my boyhood uh, kind of idol um it was 19 1986 and uh i went with him to pakistan and uh that was talk about an eye-opening experience spending about i don't know three weeks four weeks or so in pakistan traveling around to the various mines wow um, it was it was eye-opening it was tremendous i was just jacked i mean it was it was a great experience um so was it your first time out of the country or Oh, uh, first time on a, out of the country that far. Uh, you know, I think Pakistan is is nine or ten hours ahead of me here. So, uh, you know, for the first few days, I was like, okay, what time is it back home? What time is it back home? I can't believe it's noontime here because it's the middle of the night back home. Yeah. Uh, you know, so yeah, I was like a again, I was like, you know, uh, a kid with wide eyes and and like couldn't believe what I was seeing and what I was doing, and uh, it was a great experience, and certainly opened the door to to many other trips down the road. Wow. So and so it sounds like from if I can sort of pull a couple key points out here, the the importance of having a mentor in these key roles, right? Like art, kind of put this idea into your mind of the rare stones, and then took you to Tucson. And then now you're in Pakistan with another sort of mentor figure who can show you 
the way in, right? Like, cause mm -hmm. I, I mean, no, I don't think anyone would just ever fly to Pakistan alone. It, it, I mean, maybe, it, it, maybe somebody would, but <laughs> you wouldn't know what to do. You know, I mean, I'm just imagining myself when I first got into this, like even just coming to Bangkok for school was kind of intimidating. So I can't imagine sure. going to Sri Lanka when you don't know any Sri Lankans yet. And you know, you, you don't, you don't have a network yet. Um, so, yeah, I mean, yeah. You definitely you definitely have to kind of develop a network of people that you know and trust over the years. Uh, and, you know, some of the bigger shows like Tucson, certainly uh, you meet a lot of people from a lot of different countries that over the years you get to know pretty well and and are, are uh, you know, trust them and and uh, and, you know, can eventually go and have them be your guide in their country. So. Yeah. And that's pretty much what happened in, in Sri Lanka. Same thing. And, you know, it's funny, the, my first con one of my first contacts in, in Sri Lanka, uh, I, I knew him uh, before his kids were born and uh, his kids, he has one, one boy, one girl. And I mean, I've, they're in their thirties now and I, they both call me uncle John, which is kind of, kind of cool. In fact, uh, his daughter got married two years ago. So we went, my wife and I, my wife, was her first trip to Sri Lanka. And uh, we had just a wonderful time attending the wedding. And, and so cool. she, she had that same kind of wide eyed look that I did the first time I was there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the stone. So you met art, and you guys are formulating starting to formulate this well, I guess that happened later, but the rare stones thing. So you, so eventually when you guys made your company and you decided that your niche was going to be the rare stones, did you, did, was he kind of mentoring you or at least giving you some hints and tips about how to approach cutting and polishing rare stones or, or were you already ready to do that without any guidance? Um, both. I mean, I, you know, uh, he certainly had a lot more years experience than I did at the time. Uh, and I know that um, uh, I know that if I ran into a, a snag here, I could give him a call and say, hey, you know, have has this happened to you? You know, what do you suggest? What do you recommend? And uh, sometimes it would work and sometimes it wouldn't. Okay. Um, and, and I think that continues, I mean, not only with art, but uh, in, in, in our little coast to coast group between Brad and, and, and uh, Mike and I, uh, I, we're constantly changing, exchanging information about, you know, this out of the other thing, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes for the good and sometimes for the bad. Um, perfect example of that. Um, I was cutting a cuprite one time and, and you have to cold up that. And uh, sorry, Boyd Fox, if you're listening. Yes, I said cold up. Um, <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, soaking the soaking the um, the epoxy off in the solvent, you know, typically it separates from the stone quite easily, and it is no big deal. Well, for whatever reason, with cuprite, it doesn't separate so easily. It uh, it kind of gloms onto the stone, and you have to kind of rub it off carefully without scratching the stone. You know, cuprite's only a hardness of three, so. Uh, I happened to be talking to Mike one day and I said, Hey, I, I said, has this, has this ever happened to you? And he said, no, he ne it's never happened to me. And then about a week <laughs> later, he called, he says, damn it. <laughs> he <laughs> says, you did it to me. <laughs> and it's happened to him since. Okay. So, yeah, but yeah, I think the three of us, you know, uh, have exchanged information from the beginning and still exchange information uh, both, you know to the good and to the bad yeah. and the one thing that i've realized too is what works for one cutter doesn't necessarily work for another cutter yeah. i know art used to love to to polish and pre-polish with the chrome oxide ultralaps i couldn't get those things to worth for love and the money yeah but i used some laps that, that he didn't he didn't have a lot of success with yeah. so i think you know there there's more as the old saying there's more than one way to skin a cat and there's more than one way to polish a particular type of yeah. gemstone so i'm kind of curious you know obviously now we have so many options for cutting and polishing laps you know gear loose has such an amazing array and other manufacturers you know there's all these innovative types of laps but going back into the 80s uh, what was what was around at that time when you guys were, you know, getting the company together and really getting into the rare stone game? What, what were you what were your innovative techniques at that time based around? Yeah, well, you're right. I mean, there's certainly I mean, 
you know, John Rolfe and Gayluth's uh, products um, have been a, a, a huge boom to to a lot of cutters for for poli- for cutting and polishing. Uh, but yeah, back in the day, uh, you had pretty much crystallite laps and um, polishing laps. You had uh, you had phenolics. You had uh, lead tin laps. You had uh, wax laps, of course, and sometimes even wood was mm-hmm. uh, was a polishing lap that you could use. So there were very, it really very... Just the, it's kind of the classic simple ones. Yeah, yeah, and Metal, copper too. Cop, copper yeah. too. Yeah. yeah, but but obviously, yeah, there wasn't anything high tech yet because that stuff had, hadn't been uh, developed. Yeah, yeah, any of the composites, you know, and now there are a lot of composites that are out there and, yeah. and some of them work really well. Yeah. So then has your, um, as far as the tools and your laps and abrasives and stuff, has that changed over the time or are you still using the same stuff you started, started with back then? Um, well, my, my lead tin lap, which you really can't buy anymore. Um, my lead tin lap hasn't come out of its case in quite some time, but it's there in case I ever need it. Um, you know, I know it works for some things. I know it won't work for other things, but yeah, as, as technology has, has evolved, I've tried the new, uh, laps that have been available from this company and that company over the years. And, and some of them work just are tremendous and some of them not so much. And you go back to the old tried and true, like even, uh, you know, for, for sapphires, uh, I still, I still love my ceramic lap. Okay. Yeah. So what about what about have you have you used the light side? Because I know that one is specifically yeah. aimed towards like replacing the wax lap scenario. So that seems like it would be perfect for a lot of the stuff you do. But in practice, is it useful for mm-hmm. you? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, it, it, again, it doesn't necessarily work for everything. Uh, mm-hmm. And it even on a any given stone, it doesn't necessarily work for every facet. Uh, sometimes as you approach a cleavage or a close to a cleavage plane, uh, yeah, it, the, the light side um, won't work. So okay. then you go back to the old tried and true uh, wax lap. Wax lap is, is like the magic bullet for a lot of things. Wow. But the, so, but the, okay, so let's talk a little bit about the wax lap then. How did you even know how to, because you have to make this yourself, right? So how did you even know how to do that? Well, no, back in the day, they were commercially available. Uh, the okay. people that made, um, I don't remember the name of the company, um, but there was a company that made uh, various ultra laps back in the day, and they also made wax laps. But okay. that company is long since gone, and, and they're not available anymore. In fact, I still have some of those you know, commercially available wax laps that, uh, that I bought you know, way back when. Okay. Well, maybe this is a good time. I, you're in your studio now, so could we do a little bit of a walk around and just see what your cutting world looks like and um, yeah. see see what kind of tools you're using to do not only the rare stones, but you're also obviously doing the normal jewelry jewelry grade stones as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the jewelry grade stones, pretty much, like I said, um, I still love my ceramic lab for for uh, for sapphires for sure. Um, you know, they don't last forever. And so, you, you know, you, and when, once they glaze over, you either have to have it retreated or you, or you buy another lap. Um, but they last for quite some time, uh, for, tr- you know, for tourmalines and barrels and garnets. I know that a lot of people cut starting to cut, um, uh, start with quartz and that's really not a great stone to start with for, yeah. for the beginner. I mean, quartz, yeah, it cuts not so bad, but it can be a, it can be tricky to polish. Yeah. Um, but barrels, I mean, barrels, they almost polish themselves. Yeah. So that's where, really where everybody should start is, is, uh, is barrel. And I mean, it's, I guess people like quartz cause they're abundant and cheap, but, uh, light colored barrels are also abundant yeah, and cheap definitely. too. Yeah, definitely. So, same with garnets. I mean, you can, you can get so many red garnets, you could never run out of them. And they're also pretty easy to polish. Right. Right. I mean, barrels and garnets probably the, are the two easiest to, to do. Um, and again, without, well, barrels, sometimes you have to worry a little bit about orientation, but garnets, you know, you can orient them any, any old way and it's, it's yeah. fine. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, uh, it, they probably have, I never really counted, but they're gonna, it has to be at least 30 plus laps that I use for cutting and various polishing. Wow. 
So that's a collection. Okay, so yeah, let's let's walk around and just um, okay. let's check it out. Okay. I'm curious how how 30 laps has to stay organized so that they don't get uh, <laughs> contaminated and uh, and uh, you know dirty. Do you want to throw the host? Can I share my screen from here? Uh, yeah. Hold on one second, and I can. Okay, you should be able to share your screen. Let's try it. See what happens. Ooh, okay. Wow, I didn't know you could you could share it straight to the phone. That's cool. Yep, not bad, huh? Wow, you you taught me you a new a new trick. You can teach an old dog new tricks. Yeah. <laughs> so this okay. Is my cutting machine. Um, pretty much like I said, I've been working with a facet for a number of years. Uh, the first facet that I bought, I mentioned, I think I bought was from uh, Phil Bean out in Seattle, and they recommended uh, oil as a cutting fluid. Well, I think I did that for one or two stones before I realized that not only did it make a mess, but it smelled terrible. Yeah. So um, I went with uh, pretty much um, uh, the, the uh, facet when they started to be built in North Carolina. And I have two machines. Uh, one in my backup machine is probably, oh, God, that's got to be close to 30 years old anyway. Um, but my last, I mean, my last was just kind of kicking around here. Okay. Uh, I keep the, for the most part in, the, in their containers. Uh, okay, so are the ones that are in the uh, the wooden box are those ones that are you're using more often, or those are just like cutting laps? Those are cut, yeah, those are mostly cutting laps. Okay, so all the all the polishing all laps the, stay in their own the, little cases. Pretty much are covered or are left out so that I can kind of clean them off before I use them. And okay. this, this is my backup machine. This is actually this is the machine that's probably thirty plus years ago, uh, thirty plus years old. Uh, the spindle has been, I had Cindy Hine replace the, uh, the spindle because the old collets were no longer available. Um, the cutting, you know, diamond saw is pretty, pretty basic, pretty simple. Just change the blades here and there for, for uh, a variety of thicknesses. And then uh, heat treating oven here. Okay. So I laid out a few of the wax laps because not a lot of people have seen wax laps. Oh, um, yeah. Wow. Yeah, you know, I mean, some of them, yeah, they're, they're pretty thin, right? So you have to kind of put it on a, on a, on a, another lab base. And that company that I mentioned that was out in uh, Seattle, these are quite thick. And so they can be resurfaced any number of different times. And there are a few uh, varied wax laps of, you know, varied hardnesses and what have you. And I think speaking, your, uh, your video froze up a little bit. I can still hear you, but I, I you're, it's not moving anymore. Okay. Well, all right, let me come back and let me share that. Sometimes it, oh, you know why? Because I'm on time lapse. Oh. Oh, I think you, I think you have to reach. Let me get back. Let me try this again. Hold on. Okay. Technical difficulties. So far, so good. You're a little, it's a little quiet when you go away from the computer, but I think, I think we can hear you okay. I can hear you okay. I hope everyone else can hear you okay. It's just let me little... try this again. I got to learn this trick now. I didn't, I didn't even know. You know, back in the, well, I'll tell you for I finish this part here. Um, how's that? We good? Yeah, that's good now. Well, we're almost done anyway. <laughs> so, I mean, these are a couple of composite laps that, uh, again, I picked up recently in Tucson. I don't even know the name of the company, uh, but they were uh, set up at GJX. But this is a great lap for polishing uh, quartz. And this other lap here for pretty much anything else that's pretty much a chrome oxide. Are these guys, uh, it's an Israeli lap manufacturer? Uh, it could be Israeli. Uh, the company was in, um, the company was in, uh, let me get here and stop the share. They, they look like some that I was looking at recently, but the company just went out of business like a month ago. I was about to buy oh, don't one. Say that. If yeah, it's the yeah. same company as the GJX. <laughs> I should have bought more. I'm trying to think about what they're called because yeah, theirs look kind of like that. And they had a green one that was supposed to be like the super awesome one for for barrels. 
um i can't they had a real funny name though i can't remember what it was called but yeah they were trying to sell the company to somebody else oh no kidding huh that's well that's not good news because i only have you know that's that's the other thing too is over the years um you know various manufacturers like the wax lap guys and and the guy that was um making the fat wax laps up in up in seattle uh if i had known that they were going out of business out of out of stocked up yeah you know so i actually did that with uh the John Rolfe's laps. I have a number of dark sides and a number of light sides okay, that just will in case. probably ask me for the rest of maybe even yeah. for my kids' yeah. lives. I don't know. <laughs> I, have, I have quite a few of them. Could you could you pull out one of the wax ones again? Because that was when it started to freeze. I saw the first one you showed, but I want I I've never seen one, so I'm curious to just see it up close. Maybe just bring it over to this camera. Yeah, sure. Uh, which one, the fat one? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Just, yeah, the second okay. one you showed. Because I'm curious about the texture and. Um, I guess just the the durability it seems so frightening to you know when i'm imagining beeswax but maybe this is a lot more strong well, these are, than... these pretty, this, so this is this is the fat this is a the green wax is um this is one that looks clean and this okay. is one that's already charged um but the the uh, the gentleman that was up in seattle um actually this is art's old lap if you look at the core of this thing he he kind of dug it out so they could get his um his screw into it. Okay. Um, and this, the same company made a blue lap. So the blue lap and the green lap are slightly different hardnesses. So okay. they work, uh, they work fine for different materials. So when you need a little bit harder, I mean, this, this wax lap is, it's pretty hard. Okay. So it's, it, it seems more like plastic than uh, yes. something like yeah. beeswax where it's right. super soft. Right. It does, right. Do they melt? I, uh, nope. But I do score it. I mean, I, you know, I, t in order to hold the material, I'll take an old um, hacksaw blade okay. and, uh, and, and when the scores wear off, then I'll rescore it, resurface it with a okay. razor blade as it spins and then um, score it. Okay. And it holds on to the, uh, it holds on to the polishing agent pretty well. Okay. So, and when you're using those, is, is it, are you using it with oxides or diamond or, Both. or you, you can change? Yeah. Well, I have, yeah. I mean, it's ideal if you have one so you can use one for oxides one for diamond but yes you can go back and forth if you need okay. to so that so nothing's embedding you can basically just kind of rip you what do you, you wash can, it off or you just when you rescore it i know well, i read well so when it gets kind of worn down um i'll take a razor blade as it's on the fastening machine and just kind of scrape it down and uh okay. and get a new get a new surface Okay, so okay, th this makes me think of an interesting question, and I love asking this to, you know, people who are cutting for a living. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of um, feeling in the American community that I've seen, um, and and there's a like a sentiment of like we shouldn't we shouldn't modify our laps like the like when the manufacturer sends them to us, they're perfect. And if we screw them up, we probably should send them back to the manufacturer. And, you know, I learned from a Sri Lankan cutter. So we were doing, we, we you know, we do crazy stuff to our laps here. People are taking yeah. topper laps and scraping polishing laps. And I'm just like, how does that not contaminate? But it doesn't, you know, and I'm, no. so I've learned that you can do all kinds of crazy stuff and sometimes you have to. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so what, what do you think about that? Do you, do you customize your laps and do all kinds of crazy stuff to them or, or it depends on the lap? It depends on the lap for sure. Um, you know, and it depends on what you're polishing too. You know, sometimes, uh, some stones polish, uh, uh, very well on a, uh, freshly treated lap and other ones, um, don't do so well in a freshly treated lap. They need to be broken in a little little bit so okay. the type of stone also kind of varies with how the what the condition of the lap is okay so then uh, but yeah i mean you know the, the, i think i think the the bottom line is for laps is you know respect them but you also have to kind of show them who's boss <laughs> yeah yeah th that, and that's my feeling too you know sometimes sometimes they just don't work that well without some manipulation whether that be scoring or you know some people take scotch bright pads and just rough them up or yeah um, yeah. you know, hacksaw blades, like you said. Yeah. I know, um, I was trying to learn, um, I've never really learned how to use plastic laps. And, and so I got this one, like a Lucite lap, you know, 
and I was trying to use it for quartz and then this Russian cutter came in and she's like what are you doing she's like you have to score this with a razor blade yeah. it doesn't do anything and I was like oh okay it's because it's not doing anything but right. I think other people maybe like you said there's there's a million ways every cutter doesn't use the same techniques so I think that's right know, and also you know, we were always scoring bat laps. And then John Rolf talked to me. He's like, don't, you don't have to score the bat lap. Don't tell people to do that. And I was like, okay, you made it. So I'm going to listen to you. But I also have one bat lap that stays scored because sometimes I need an aggressive, a really aggressive okay. bat lap. Yeah. Yeah. I've never, I've never scored a bat lap. I have a few uh, bat laps that I, that I use at various times, you know, one with, uh, I think 3000 diamond, one with 60,000 diamond. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, yeah, I've never scored them. And so John, if you're listening, you should be happy. <laughs> I stopped well, after he told me that I, I, I understand why he says that. I mean, I understand the mathematical complexity that goes into the lap and it makes total sense. And I stopped teaching that way. Once he told me that just to respect his wishes, sure. but at the same time, I, I've also had a, um, a worn out bat lap that I rescored during a stone polishing and it was like night and day difference of speed and uh, polishing quality so I'm just like you know whatever you you know they're tools right we, we yeah exactly if you, if you are a carver or an engraver they make all their tools you know it would be ridiculous to think that you're gonna buy you know even thinking about people that I've spoken to previously on this show you know like people have specifically said we would never buy all these bits it would be so expensive and you need yeah. custom shapes and stuff so they always make their tools and so it, you know it kind of makes sense as you know those are our tools those are those are the thing that does the work so it makes sense yeah well the same thing with with any of the you know the gemstone carvers you know they they make a lot of their own uh uh tools bits and what have you for yeah for polishing or for cutting because you just can't, you know, you just can't necessarily buy them. So, uh, you know, uh, Michael Diver and any of the, the, yeah. um, the, you That's know, the, uh, about. yeah. Yeah. So, so, okay. So, well, you know, before you, I, I, what I just realized, I know you talked to Michael Diver a little while ago. So, so of your 14 interviews that you've done, two of them have been New Hampshire cutters. Oh, okay. Yeah. I forgot he was in New Hampshire. <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah you i guess that's uh we're getting a strong uh, vibe from this side of the country i guess <laughs> well or just maybe there's a, a lot of creative people in one place who knows i'm sure though could i could be. i could i could do a whole series of just people in california though because you know there's so many cutters in california as well yep um but so okay so talk to us a little bit more so you, you wax laps you know obviously we just saw you got a ton of laps is it is it every time you start a new stone you know i'm speaking about the rare the rare ones have you done enough of them at this point where you you kind of know them all or do you still get a do you still get a kind of a new variety or a new mineral that you've never tried and and you just have to totally guess like no one's ever done it before oh absolutely for sure um and a lot of that is based on what the um what the optical properties are what the physical properties are um, as I'm grinding, the finish that I see on the grind kind of gives me an indication of what might the best polish might be. Uh, and you might try it, it might not work at all. Yeah. And then you try something else. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, one that comes to mind is sterminite. You know, sterminite is a, is a very, very soft mineral from South Africa. And I, you know, you would think that the finer the grind, the better the polish. Uh, no. No, you can you can actually you, you you can't polish it if you fine grind it. You actually have to polish it from a coarser finish. Oh, okay. So every stone has its own learning curve. Yep, definitely, uh, definitely. So can you tell us like um, I'm just thinking about like horror stories. What's the worst one, or or can what what what's the one that pops off your the top of your head like the worst experience you've had so far with rare. Well, I can tell you, I can tell you a story that not many people have ever heard of, uh, and certainly not many cutters, unless they've done this particular stone, um, cerusite. Okay. And it's a, it's a, it's a lead, uh, lead carbonate, I believe. Um, very soft, uh, very heat sensitive. In fact, if you have a, a cold stone and a warm hand or vice versa, 
the stone will crack. Wow. Okay. So super uh, you real yeah, so you're super heat sensitive. You really have to be careful with generating any heat on the lap or what have you. Um, so uh, one year, I don't remember how many years ago it was, but um, one year before Tucson, I was cutting a through site. It was probably, I don't know, 20 or 30 carats or so. And uh, it developed a crack. It happens, right? Oh, I don't have enough time to finish, fix this before the show. So I'll just put it aside and I'll get back to it, you know, another day. And I don't know how, it was later that year, maybe in the summer or so when I was back at cutting. And uh, I picked the through site up off the top that had the crack in it and the crack was gone. <laughs> it was gone. And I'm thinking to myself, did it really crack? Was I really kind of overworked before Tucson? Did it, was it really that bad? And I took a very close look and it was still there, but it looked more like a, a very faint, like almost like a twinning plane looks, you know, okay. as opposed to a crack. And I was pretty sure that it was a crack. And uh, I happened to mention it to, to both Mike and Brad and they looked and they said, I thought I was the only one that, that happened to. <laughs> <laughs> so it actually does kind of heal itself. And I have no explanation as to how or why it does that. Wow. But it's the only stone that I've ever seen that that happens to. That's crazy. I never heard of that. I've never heard of anything yeah, like I, that. Well, you know, it, it, the average person certainly wouldn't know that. And there aren't many cutters that do cut through site. So, uh, you know, that the, the, the pool of that possibly happening to is pretty small. Yeah. And so what's your favorite rare stone to cut? Do you, do you have one that you go back to a lot? Um, not really. I, I, you know, the, the one thing I, I mean, I get asked a lot, you know, what's your favorite stone to, 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 you know, to have, to sell, to buy, um, to cut, what have you. And my response is pretty much the same every time. I really don't have a favorite. I'm just so happy that I don't have to cut the same stone every yeah. day. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the variety, the challenge of the different uh, types of stones uh, is always something that is important to me and, and keeps, you know, keeps me kind of on my toes. Yeah. Uh, if, you know, if I got, if I was a diamond cutter, oh my God, I think I'd probably shoot myself by Friday. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, just having the, the variety of things to do and to, and to uh, experiment with and to see if I can improve, you know, with, with a lot of the soft stones, it's not so difficult to round a facet. Well, you know, that's not ideal. So, you know, the, per, the, the, uh, the idea is to get as flat a facet as possible on a rare stone with a good polish. Yeah. And that's, that's really the trick. Do you ever have some stones that are so soft that you're just polishing them with the motor off and you're just manually either yeah. turning the lap or, or just yeah. rubbing the stone? Yep. So, yep. So, so there's no rules now. Anything goes, whatever you have and to do. Whatever, whatever, whatever works. Yeah. Whatever works. Yeah. Sometimes you can put a little bit of polish on a, on a little chamois and just kind of, you know, do a little rubbing with the finger and it'll polish. Well, will it stay flat that way or is it your no. finger so soft? No. Yeah. You're going to round, you're going to round it a little bit, but you know, in, in real gars and cinnabars, uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you can deal with a little roundness. Okay, so then speaking of cinnabars, I was wondering this before. Do you are there some rare stones that are, that are not healthy that you try to avoid? Like cinnabar is toxic, right? Well, or, yeah, but you're not eating you, it, I mean, right? But yeah. maybe some are even toxic for touching or or radioactive or something like that. Do you stay? You do? Are you careful about you know being aware of what's inside of these stones, or are you just like whatever? Anything? No rules. If I, yes and no. I mean, I, I don't go overboard with being crazy, you know, putting on a hazmat suit when I'm cutting yeah. a crocoite. Um, although crocoite probably is one of the messiest stones that you'll ever cut. Um, it's a beautiful orange color, but, you know, grinding it on the lap, you just, it, I mean, the, the entire lap just turns kind of a yellowy orange okay. and uh, it, it, it stains everything. Uh, I know some cutters, you know, cut with gloves on and I don't cut with gloves on except when I'm cutting crocoite okay. because not only will it stain the lap, but it will also stain your fingers. It will stain your clothes. Wow. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's about as careful as I get is wearing a rubber glove when I cut a crocoite. I know. Oh, cuprite, cuprite, same, cuprite as well. 
Okay. I know I've cut lapis before, and that one is amazing because of the water just totally turns blue. But it, do, yep. it, it doesn't really, I don't think it really stains. At least I don't remember it staining anything. Yeah, no, lapis, yeah, lapis doesn't stain, but it does turn it blue for sure. Yeah, it looks yeah. pretty though, so. But yeah, <laughs> but well, cuprites, okay. crocoites, definitely stain. Let's look at some stones. You sent me some photos so we can keep talking about the stones, but we'll get some visuals for um, for us and for the guests. So okay. I didn't take any notes. I just threw them in here. So you you got to you got to narrate us and tell us what we're looking at. OK, uh, so this is a series of um, uh, aquamarine radiance uh, from three different locales. The uh, stone on the left, actually the stone on the left, um, I don't remember the weight off the top of my head, but this stone is in the Smithsonian. Uh, years ago, when the Smithsonian was doing um, the renovation of their, of their hall, they wanted to send up a photographer to my, to my shop to kind of, you know, photo uh, uh, the, the process from rough to, to cut. And this is the stone that was, that was done for them. Uh, back in the day. Uh, the stone in the middle is from uh, Madagascar and the stone on the right is a, a, a natural stone from Zambia from one of the first parcels that I bought back in the early years of Tucson. Wow and it's a really cool example of just the variety of colors of blue and green that you can get in in aquamarine. And all unheated. Wow okay okay so let's see what else oh, where did it go okay so what do we got here? Uh, that's just a kind of a fun little uh, citrine uh, playing with various facet designs on a square stone, uh, more of a Portuguese bottom just to kind of give it a, a little bit of a, a little bit of a zip. Okay, so are you, are, when you are planning and, and figuring out what you're going to do with a stone, are you using diagrams and software or do you just improvise or, or somewhere in the middle? Somewhere in the middle. Um, I mean, I will look at a diagram for a particular stone, but, you know, uh, unless it is a length to width ratio of exactly what you're doing, it doesn't make any difference. So I'll, I'll look at the pattern and um, I'll look at the pattern and kind of remember it and, and kind of relate that pattern into what I'm doing on the lap. Okay. And I do have, I do have on my computer gem cut studio, uh, but I, to be honest, I really haven't used it at all. Okay. So, okay, well, let's keep on. And then I got more questions about that. So what are we looking at with this one? Uh, so this is a, this is a Mashishi barrel. Um, Fred Poe, who was the um, uh, uh, curator of the American Museum of Natural History, and one of the first guys to get some of the Mashishis out of Brazil, the natural material. This was in his collection. And um, when he passed away, I uh, helped his family. Uh, sell some of his material and this is one of the stones that I kept and recut mm, okay so do you find so just what, from what we've seen so far it looks like you have a preference towards you know sort of radiant slash princess style bottoms or is that true or do you or do we just happen to see three similar ones in a row <laughs> No, I do a lot of that. I, you know, depending on what the stone is, um, uh, a, a lot of times I'll do a brilliant bottom and a, and a step cut top. Okay. Uh, if, if in some cases, uh, I think there's, I think I sent you, um, I don't know if it's coming up or not, but I sent you a picture of a, a sapphire cabochon and a sapphire cut stone. Yeah. Uh, there you go. So this is, a, this was a, I believe a 33 carat uh, quote unquote star sapphire um that came out of an old collection and it had some it had some rutile needles in it um but the star was significantly off center and okay. uh it was really not not a very pretty stone so i ended up uh sending it out to to uh get the rutile dissolved and in hopes of actually even improving the color which it might have a little bit and i think maybe this is the next slide the finished stone there it is yeah so here's the opposite Here's a step cut bottom with a brilliant top. Okay. And the reason that it was done in this case is was it was a fairly light colored stone. So I wanted to keep as much color as I could. So I did the step cut bottom with a brilliant top. Yeah. A lot of times with other material, I'll do a brilliant bottom with a step cut top uh, it, it to, you know, especially in lighter, good, uh, um, lighter materials or in material that has um, a high refractive index to give it a little bit better pop. Okay. 
So then is that something that you just learned over time, you know, as far as when to use a step cut, when to use a brilliant cut, you know, learning to lighten the stone, darken the stone? Yeah, just... yeah. Did basically trial and error. Yeah, definitely. Okay. And then what are we seeing here? Uh, that's a Burmese Peridot. Uh, again, um, material was acquired out of an old collection. Uh, the stone, originally the stone was about as deep as it was long. So it was kind of like a big ice cream cone. Okay. And so I kind of uh, recut, recut the whole thing actually to, to same thing, uh, brilliant cut bottom with a step cut top. Okay, so this is like your signature style, I guess. I've, I guess, I, I guess, I, you know what? I never even thought of it, but I guess maybe it is. <laughs> I haven't seen a lot of people do it. A couple of people have told me because I, because, you know, I'm talking to like a lot of different people and I'm looking at a lot of the classical styles, which is usually the opposite, right? It's usually the brilliant top and the step cut bottom is like yep. the classic mixed cut. And a couple of people have told me like, no, I like to do it the other way around. And I always thought like, oh, that's, that's a bit weird. I haven't seen that too much, but now that I'm seeing it, I'm like, okay, yeah, I guess it makes sense. It kind of gets, it gives a nice frame and then yep. you're, you have a nice focal point too. Right. Same right. Here. Right. Uh, same thing here. This actually uh, was um, Maine, uh, the state of Maine's largest uh, smoky quartz. I think this was 464 carats. Oh, wow. And um, Derek Katzenbach beat me out in the last year or so. Um, uh, I forget how much his weighed, but it, it was it was definitely more than the 464. Yeah, so, you know, great. records are made to be broken. So. Yeah. so how big is this like in your hand? Is this like a baseball? Um, I'd have to look up the dimensions, but uh, yeah, it's it's good size. I mean, 400, 400 carat quartz is not, you know, yeah. it doesn't fit between your fingers. Yeah. Well, I remember seeing a picture of, uh, well, Derek has a slideshow of him cutting that one and it's just ridiculous. It's like a football. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's yeah. smaller, but it's huge. It's crazy huge. Yeah, some of the bigger stones, uh, you know, I've I've cut them. I've cut stones on my eight-inch wheel up to you know thirteen hundred carats. Wow. Um, uh, Mike Mike Gray, uh, my one of my coast coast partners, he has cut uh, many many stones in the thousands of carats, and you really can't do that on an eight-inch wheel. But he has a uh, a large machine that was custom made to be able to handle large stones. I think it was a um, I think it's a 12 or a 14 inch wheel. Wow. Is, and th this is using a custom mast or he just puts a, his same mast on a big wheel? No, it's a, a custom mast. Yeah, the whole, wow. the whole so machine. It's a, it's a giant yeah. size machine. It's a yeah, it's, size. And it weighs a ton. Yeah. Gosh. Okay, that's crazy. So that's real um, dedication to, to actually have a machine built just to do. Just for big stones. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. I appreciate that. Okay, well, so what are we seeing here? Uh, a nice little bicolor tourmaline. You know, most bicolors tend to have some inclusions in it, especially at the color junction. Um, and this one, this one didn't. Uh, so I, it was just a good example of a, of a straight emerald cut with steep ends. You can see a little bit on the left-hand side, uh, a little bit of the red color uh, coming through from the other side. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and that was just because the stone was tipped a little bit. Yeah. So, yeah, this is interesting. Like, I... You know, in here in Thailand, the cutters are thinking about stones in such a different way that, you know, they're not thinking about angles and diagrams and anything because they don't have it that way with their machines. Right. It's all about proportions. And so our, last year, you know, we, we're in COVID, so we had lots of downtime and I was talking, I would, you know, we're just kind of chatting up the uh, factory manager and he starts talking about keel length. And he's like, oh, the keel, the keel length, it's so important, you know, like for this kind of stone, you want a long keel for this type of material, you want the short keel. And then, you know, obviously the shorter becomes a brilliant kind of a point. And but he was talking about bicolor and he's like, the long keel is good because you're not having cross reflection. And I was like, I was like, I guess I knew that already, but I never thought about it in terms of keel proportion, because I just I think most American cutters don't think about proportion that much other than just the length, the width. But right, right. Well, in a, in a, I mean, certainly in a bicolor or in a tourmaline that has a, uh, a dark C axis or even an ugly C axis, the, the ends really, um, well, you kind of walk a tightrope because you have to cut steep ends. Otherwise you'll drag that ugly or black color into the stone, yeah. but you don't want to, yeah. you don't want to cut it too deep so that it becomes unsettable. Right. So, you know, 65 degrees is my favorite uh, mm -hmm. angle to use in a, in a case like this. Although, you know, I'll go down to 60 if I, if I'm forced to, uh, but 65 is ideal. Yeah. 
I know I was having the same conversation with my wife the other day because we were, I don't know, making a design or something. And she was like, sometimes I go up to 80 if it's really a black C axis. And I'm like, whoa, 80. I didn't know, you know, I didn't know you could get away with it. But she said, no, it's OK. You know, as long as if, unless the stone's really big or something. But well, it, also, depending on how you're going to set it, too. You yeah. know, I've had I've had a lot of setters, you know, yell at me like it's too steep on the ends. <laughs> yeah. 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 Of course. Yeah. That, that side's going to need like a deeper setting but i guess you know she was saying they did that in the factory in geneva and it's they're still it able, huh. still able okay. to, to do it so it's okay so okay last one what are we looking at here uh this was a recut of a um an orange tourmaline from nigeria same thing this this uh is not brilliant cut bottom and a, and a step cut top this is a brilliant bottom and a brilliant top okay. um just an unusual color and an unusual size. I think this was around 10 carats. I think I forget the exact weight. And the colors is amazing. It looks like a sapphire or something. Oh, yeah. 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 A, a nice pumpkin orange for this time of year. Yeah, it's perfect. So this stone makes me want to ask one of my favorite questions that I like to ask all gem cutters. How do you do your girdles? Because I see here that you've got a smooth girdle. So are you freehanding or do you facet the girdle and then smooth it at the end? I, I typically will facet the girdle in the beginning to get my facet layout right. And then um, when I do the crown, I'll cut the, uh, I'll cut the, the, it, um, the first row of facets down pretty, pretty thin and then freehand it to, 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 um, to okay. eliminate the, the faceted girdles. So you'll freehand it while, while you're still in the process of doing the bottom yeah. facets. Oh, okay. yeah. oh, no, in the process of cutting the top. Oh, so on the second side. Are you yeah. you're doing pavilion first though? Normally, yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so what about on the rare stones? I mean, I know I don't know if this is totally true, but at least in my experience of cutting some or at least buying some rare stones, most of them are colorless. Is that usually true, or is that not true? What rare stones colors? Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I mean, I think rare stones certainly are, are the whole run the whole gamut of color from colorless to yellow and browns and blues and greens and yellows and pinks and and purples and what have you. Uh, it, true, a lot of them are colorless, but, uh, you know, in a perfect world, uh, you want some you want some color in your in your case. Yeah. So then when when you're approaching the design for, you know, a rare because we, we saw a lot of beautiful but um, normal jewelry style stones here. So if you're approaching a rare stone of course rare stone probably means yield becomes as important as you know the most expensive sapphires right or or do you have some flexibility with sacrifice yeah i mean i'll i'll always sacrifice weight for for look for beauty okay. um you know it uh, uh, to me uh, a beautiful stone that weighs a few points less Will sell far easier than a than a stone that weighs a few points more that you that isn't so beautiful. Right. So but, well, yeah, but I mean, in the case of your bicolored tourmaline, I mean that was a typical emerald cut. You could have mm -hmm. given it a princess cut or something, but it for that cut it makes of course it makes a lot of sense to not mix the colors up. So right. I'm just wondering if let's say if you are cutting a colorless rare stone. Um, then it's going to obviously make more sense probably to do something more brilliant, right? Because you need some flash for the colorless material. But if it's how, colorless, yeah. How, yeah. Do you, how do you decide? I mean, do you just look at the rough and just as if it was any normal stone? Is there any special needs for the rare stone? Uh, no, I mean, same thing. I mean, you're looking at the optical properties and the physical properties and any orientation uh, demands that the stone might have. You know, uh, in, some, in some cases, cleavage is an issue uh during cutting and polishing and in some cases it's not an issue at all okay. um like fluorite Flu uh, fluorite is a perfect example fluorite has four directions of cleavage um but who cares i mean they they all they all polish the same no matter where oh, you, okay. you line them up it might as well be isometric okay. um whereas other so calcite calcite is critical to know where the cleavage is yeah. uh, calcite is the is really the kind of the bane of my existence uh, it, it <laughs> I, I cut I cut one calcite a year just to remind myself how much I don't like cutting calcite. Okay, so this um, is that's your that's your worst then that's your most hated stone. Uh, it's up there. It's in the top three anyway. <laughs> okay. And then are there 
some rare stones that we, we might not know about that have like really, let's say, in, incredible RI or incredible scintillate, um, not scintillation, but um, dispersion? Oh, God, yeah. Um, perfect example. Uh, the highest one that I know of, wolfenite. Okay. Uh, wolfenite is an extremely rare stone. Um, it almost always is in small sizes, but the biofrind, uh, the, uh, the dispersion is 0.22. It's, I mean, it's huge. Okay. It's huge. Wow. So then if you're going to cut a, st okay. So obviously if we're a high dispersion stone, again, you're, that's kind of calling for a brilliant cut, right? Or something mm -hmm. with more brilliant type facets. Or something that you can disperse the light, uh, you know, um, both sphalerite and sphene have a dispersion that are higher, that's higher than diamond. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I mean, ideally those things look great as a brilliant stone, but also if you're, if your step cuts are, uh, depending on how your step cut arrangement is, that can also, you know, give a great look as yeah, well. Like if you have a really busy step cut on the bottom, lots of small right. facets. Yeah, yep. okay, I've seen that. I mean, they do a zircon a lot like that too. Or, you yeah. know, busy yep. bottom, super scintillated. Busy bottom, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then, so what about on the other end? What if you have a stone where the properties are just let's say they're just really dull, you know, like a low RI, even, you know, super low RI, and maybe it doesn't have an amazing color, but it has that rarity factor. What, what do you do to try to spice it up? Uh, you know, sometimes there's only so much you can do, you know, you can, you can put a tuxedo on a pig, but it's still a pig. <laughs> um, and so in, in a lot of rare stones, the, the stones sell because of their rarity, not because of their necessarily their beauty. I right. mean, you still want to, you still want to do it, do justice and, and put a good polish on it. But I, uh, in, in many cases, there's only so far that, that you can go, yeah. you know, to make yeah. it look good. Yeah. Yeah, I imagine if you have a soft stone that also has a low RI, you're, everything's against you in terms of like br creating shine and brilliance and, and yep. even like a good uh, reflection. Right, exactly. So then what about on the other end? Like what, what, what would be like a really incredibly colorful, you know, um, rare stone that we maybe have not heard about? <sighs> Well, you know, in Tucson, we probably have uh, at our booth, we probably have over 125 different species to begin with. Okay. And to us, you know, we kind of have the same kinds of things uh, every year. So they're not necessarily foreign to us, but a lot of the people that come to the booth, some of the names are definitely foreign to them. Yeah. And so it's, that's a hard question for me to answer because I, I'm not sure what, you know, uh, what might be foreign to somebody is not so far. No, they're all normal to you now. They're all normal to me. Yeah, exactly. So I, so I guess people just have to come to your booth because these, yeah. this is going to be like a treat, not even just for a gem cutter, but just any gem lover to see some of these. Yeah. Like, do you, are, do you, are you ever aware that you might be the only person that's ever faceted some of these materials or, or someone else has already done Oh, you know, for sure. Um, uh, in fact, you know, I, I know that I don't think that any other company has ever had a faceted talc. Um, okay. and, and, and we've, we've had that in the past. Uh -huh. Um, but the, yeah, there are a lot of stones that I don't think, uh, to the best of my knowledge, anyway, I may be wrong, but to the best of my knowledge outside of coast to coast, I don't know as if anybody has done the variety that we have done. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it seems like, are you thinking about, at all writing some kind of a book i mean you're like a, the only one you know one of three masters of the rare mineral <laughs> it seems you know it seems like sometime the even just a photo book you know like i don't know if you have photos of a lot of these stones that you've done but it just seems like it's such a unique and rare uh thing to do um it's to me it seems like a, a book would make sense yeah, I, you know, maybe someday when when I have you know a few seconds to rub together. But yeah. uh, you know, it's been it's been so so busy for so many years that you know I, I do right now. I mean, for the um, uh, for the for the guide, uh, General International out of Chicago, they published the guide, the pricing guide for colored stones. Mm -hmm. And for the last I don't know ten or twelve years or so, uh, I've been doing their gem notes. You know, every other month, okay. and pretty much on rare stones. So. 
you know, uh, I, I do have some rare stone information that's out in the out, out in the public domain for sure. I guess that could be assembled someday into a book. Yeah. Uh, the one thing that I do have um, that I keep nearby my cutting machine is one of the old Vargas um, fastening books. Okay. And uh, in that book, he has, you know, various rare stones, not all of them that we have done, but he has had, he has various rare stones that are listed and some of the methods to polish. Well, as the years have gone by, I've made notes in that book of how I've done a certain stone on a certain date. So, you know, that, that has, that has become quite a, quite a diary of, of cutting. Yeah. Uh, so. Well, this is what I'm sort of imagining. I mean, if you take the gem notes and your, your recipes basically, and a bunch of beautiful photos, that's, that's a concept right there, you know, and, and yeah. the only yeah. one that could do it. I mean, you three, not just you, but you three are the only ones that could make such a thing. It could be pretty cool. Retirement oh, yeah. project. Be cool. Well, you know, first of all, congratulations on your book. And, and you seem to have the knack of writing books down. So, you know, can I task you with writing that book? <laughs> you, can be well, you, can, you, can, <laughs> you can task me with cheerleading you on. And then uh, when you're ready to publish it, we can because now I've got the publishing thing figured out. Yeah, there and you we, go we made a publishing company. So now there's a couple people that I've talked to, like some mentors of mine that I know are working on books. And I'm just like, you let me know when you're ready, because I know how to do it now. It's it's <laughs> it's hard or it's not hard, but it's just like, it's like learning how to facet a rare stone, right? You have to try <laughs> and make a mistake. And, you know, there's a whole bunch of variables that get thrown at you that you have to sift through. And then at the end, you have hopefully a beautiful thing, right? Right. So, yeah. The only the, the the closest thing that I've come to a book so far is I I wrote the uh, the chapter on uh, Maine gemstones in uh, the Mineralogy of Maine that was published a number of years ago. Yeah. And uh, that was pretty much when back when I was um, uh, with with Harvard, and uh, Jonathan Kankas actually reviewed my chapter, and I still have his notes, which is kind of cool. That's cool. That's. Uh... If I, the author is Val King or something like that. Van King. Van King. Yeah, Van. yeah. Yeah. I recently found that book because I've been researching Maine and someone sent me the PDF and I was just like, whoa, this book is actually really, really good. Like every really good. chapter, really well researched. I mean, it's a whole bunch of people um, yeah. writing yeah. it, but. It, wow. Well, it's actually, it's in, the book is in actually in two volumes, uh, volume one and volume two. I think the the gemstones of Maine is volume two, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. I know there's a, for me, there's a chapter on the uh, sort of like historical Maine gem cutters going back to the yeah. 1800s. And I was just like, I can't believe this exists. Like this yeah. is so helpful to me. And the people that wrote it have passed away now, but I'm just like, man, if I could just go back and thank them. Um, I talked to Van, he, cause he knew them. I think it was, uh, Schaub is the name. And, and Schaub. Yep. And, Schaub. And, and I guess like in the 50s and 60s, he got a tape recorder and just went and interviewed all the gem cutters. And Van has all these tapes. Oh, no kidding. Still, he inherited them. But he said, I, I asked him if I could, you know, digitize them. And he was like, they're, I don't know if they're disintegrated or what, but he said, there, <laughs> there's nothing to hear anymore. I don't know if they're huh. just too old, maybe the magnetic. Yeah, that could be stuff's falling off or but that's a bummer but it's just amazing to think that in the 50s and 60s somebody was thinking about doing that kind of documentation i love that so i i hope i can meet him at some point because he's he's out there in your yeah no ben king he's good he's a good guy um yeah. he was actually he was another one that was kind of on on my coast and that i would see several times uh throughout the course of the year both in in tucson uh, also at the Rochester uh, Mineral Symposium for a number of years. Yeah, because he's, near, he's near Rochester, right? Or somewhere in yeah. northwestern yeah. yeah. New York. New York, yeah. Okay. Um, so what, what? I'm trying to think if there's anything else I need to ask you. I think there is. Let me look, <laughs> at, my, let me look at my notes. Um, so you've been in the house for the last two years, like all of us. Actually, were, no. Oh, you've you've been out and about this whole time? Yeah, I mean, I've been uh, so when we shut down in what March of 2020, yeah. and uh, you know, I kind of went, oh my god, you know, I, first of all, I had plenty of things to do. I had plenty of things to cut. In fact, I probably won't cut everything that I have for the, you know, uh, that that I have in house for the rest of my life. I don't think I could cut it if I never left again. Um, so I had plenty to do, and I was a little worried that you know when things began to open up again that 
that uh, you know a jewelry store wouldn't be running to the phone to to buy a sapphire from from me. And I, you know, I was wrong because when things began to open up, at least here in my area, in May of 2020, um, business has skyrocketed, just oh, skyrocketed. That's great. So I started back on the road uh, in the summer of 2020. Uh, you know, in and out of stores, um, flew a few times, flew out to, um, I flew out to Montana. My, my first flight was in September of 2020, uh, which was, you know, I, in the, in the, in before COVID, I was flying at least twice a month. Okay. And, uh, you know, so to go from March to September, six months without flying, it was very odd to go back to an airport, but I flew flew out to Montana to actually look at a, at a uh, collection that had become available for sale. And uh, it was the first time that I had flown. It was very strange, but it was, it was oddly similar, but different at the same time. Okay. Um, but yeah, no, I've been, I mean, it's pretty much, uh, pretty much I've been, I've been <clears throat> traveling since. Uh, the one thing that I did do in house that I didn't do initially because we couldn't, you know, a lot of the shows were still open and they were, they were doing a lot of virtual stuff. Uh, but they didn't have many customers coming in into the store. And, you know, before COVID, I, I did a lot of in-store gemstone roundtables with, with jewelers. And that was kind of out of the question. So I kind of revamped that into a virtual Gemini that I was doing uh, from here, uh, you know, sharing my, sharing my, on the phone, like, as I did with you to show stones okay. and, uh, uh, you know, give a little 10, 15 minute presentation ahead of time, then, then show stones and what have you. We did the same thing for Tucson, you know, Tucson was, was canceled. And, uh, uh, a lot of our international clientele still needed goods. So, uh, they asked if we could somehow, you know, get goods to them. And I said, well, how about if we can show you some goods, you know, live, and they were all over that. So oh, cool. I kind of revamped my virtual Gemini's to be able to do that. And that was incredibly successful. I mean, I, I was, I was amazed at how successful it was in February. You know, I, I certainly missed seeing all of our customers and all of the people in, in person, but it was great to be able to connect that way and, yeah. and still do a little bit of business. Do you think, I, I haven't tried to do so much selling via zoom or live events. I've, I've done a few and I felt like the quality of the video is so hit and miss and the colors and the white balance starts moving around. Did you, do you have, have you had any, you know, hiccups with that or, or did anyone get something that they were like, Ooh, that's totally not what I was thinking about. Uh, no, you know, well, first of all, the, the, um, uh, I, in fact, I saw your your uh, online video this morning. Um, uh, your comparison of iPhone yeah, with eight phone, plus yeah. with the iPhone thirteen, and I also have the uh, the eight plus. Okay. And uh, I, you know, I think it does a great job. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and that's pretty much what I use for the virtual sales. Okay. Uh, the second most important thing is lighting. Yeah. So uh, I have uh, basically three lights um, over a a very white turntable that um that pretty much is 5000 5500 kelvin so it's a very white light okay and uh so it lights up the air in there bright so it it lights up the area really really well um and we were able to show stones pretty accurately cool that's awesome yeah the time i tried to do it we were doing it with like a bunch of dslrs and it's all this gear and Oh, it was, it was, it was stressful just to try and switch around to all those cameras and stuff. Uh, yeah. Well, in our virtual Tucson, you know, remember that, that in coast to coast, the, the three of us are, you know, in different offices, you know, from, yeah. from New Hampshire to California and, and Canada. So we had, we each had inventory in each one of our offices. So we would have to kind of coordinate, uh, Sphalerite. You know, I have sphalerite. Brad has sphalerite. Mike doesn't have any sphalerite, so we'll do those two, and then we'll shift over to Mike for him to do. You know, so yeah, so it was kind of an organizational thing to to shift the host back and forth to to save as much time as possible, but still be able to show everybody everything that yeah. we had. It, it's kind of. I was just thinking about this. It's kind of amazing that you guys have been doing this for this long with the three of you. I mean, I know before it was a different three of you, but still. Um, in my short experience of the gem trade so far, when people come together and make companies together, a lot of times that doesn't work because of the personalities and stuff. So it's amazing that you guys are able to keep and, and adapt with COVID and everything else. You know, there's no, 
well, I don't know, maybe there is, but there seems like it's <laughs> hard, you know, seems to be harmonious. And the times that I've seen you guys in the Tucson show, you're hanging out, uh, you know. Oh, after, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we actually do like each other, um, <laughs> you know, uh, and I've, it's not the first time I've heard that. I mean, uh, you know, uh, as you as you mentioned, a lot of people get together to form a company and, you know, six months later, they're 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 at each other yeah. and it doesn't last more than a year. And we're, you know, we really started back in 1987 or so and and still are going strong to this day. I mean, we don't necessarily talk every day all year long, but before Tucson or before a major event, uh, yeah, we're on the phone or, you know, back and forth with email between us uh, a lot to kind of coordinate and organize the inventory for a particular show and what have you. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, yeah, I mean, it all, it all works. I, I, I I guess we're just kind of meant to meant to be. Yeah, it's so cool. Do you think that you guys have created a sort of niche market by by having these products available? Because of course, other you know, you can get rare stones other places here and there, but to have a sort of abundant, consistent source of them from you three, have you created some have you created a demand that didn't exist before that? Uh, yeah, I think to some extent, yes. Um, you know, what's, what's difficult, I guess, too, is, is, you know, as you mentioned, other other people in other countries have have rare stones that uh, that have come from their country and that, that have been cut in, in their country or what have you. And then when it comes to selling them, they don't know exactly what the what the price should be or is. So they end up putting a price, you know, up here somewhere because they're afraid of selling it, you know, for less money than it's worth. Yeah. And oftentimes, you know, that doesn't really work for us because at our, you know, if you think about it, we're kind of ground zero for a lot of these things. Um, you know, Mike and and his family was in, uh, were involved with the Benito White mine for 35 years. Okay. And so he's gr we're ground zero for Benito White. Yeah. And and so if a Benito White sells from us to another dealer, it goes to another dealer, it goes to another dealer and each time increases price a little bit. What's actually the price of that stone? Is it what we sold it at, or is it somewhere along the line? You know, it's it's a, a little hard to say. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, because we're cutting from rough um, in most cases, uh, it, we pretty much are. It's hard for us to buy cut stones to sell because they're they're at our point in the food chain. It's it can't be done. Right. You, you're at the beginning, so you should be the cheapest, actually, consi considering that other people are going to be moving them around in their own yeah. countries or whatever. Right, right. It, which might explain the, the the throngs running to our booth in Tucson on opening yeah. day. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I'm I'm just curious, like, you know, because I, I know you guys have, you know, a, a community of repeat customers are are all those customers like having totally different needs or do they want whatever you have or they're only looking for like one specific kind of stone or what is it like with that particular community of buyers um the, well each i mean each buyer certainly certainly has has their wants their needs their likes their dislikes um uh so you kind of get to know that over the time um benito white probably is the one uh universal stone that everybody seems to want and we we really we can't show any one customer all of the benito white all at the same time mm. because they'd buy it and then you'd <laughs> you know you'd, you'd you'd kind of piss off all your other customers yeah so we have it kind of kind of parceled out so that all of our regular customers uh you know have a tray to look at and then anything that's left from that tray kind of goes into the communal communal you know inventory at the end okay. and is available to anybody so you guys are really taking care of it's not you're not just letting them fight amongst amongst themselves you're looking after them yeah well them you know in, in some cases too on opening day when when we have you know 30 or 40 people at the booth two minutes into the show and a dealer has a tray in his hand but he has a dealer on each shoulder waiting for him to put that down onto the table it kind of puts the impetus on him to you know tension right yeah wow. yeah it's, it's I, a nice it's a nice problem to have <laughs> i think maybe if i can pull it off this year i'm going to try and be at your booth on opening day just and just i just want to watch this whole thing because i <laughs> i heard about this before and i'm like oh i want to see this in person this is a unique phenomenon in the tucson show so i'm going to look you up 
uh, that yeah. well, there there are actually a few booths in Tucson that people actually run to on opening day, but um, you know, we're we're so fortunate to be one of them. Yeah. Uh, I know that you know we we um, at GJX we're guarded by the Tucson police, you know, during the day and also at night. And one of the relatively new uh, policemen came up to my booth about halfway through the show, and he said, uh, he said, John, he says, could I ask you a question? I said, yeah, sure. He said, uh, what the hell are you guys selling down here in the corner that everybody's <laughs> running to your booth on opening day? <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. I yeah. Um, so I don't know. I, 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 there's so many things to ask, but I, 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 we're, we're getting towards the end here. So if, if, if there's a faceter out there, whether they're watching it here now live or are going to watch this on YouTube later, a faceter that wants to get into rare stones, what would you say to them? How, how do you how do you start? Well, get, getting into rare stones now is very difficult. In fact, for even for us, for for replacing some of the things that we sell is extremely difficult unless we have you know some backup inventory. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, when I when I mentioned the Rotocross site in, in Munich, these things aren't off the shelf items, and they're not available all the time. Um, the, there are, I don't think there are any in, around the world. Uh, rare stone mines that that mine exclusively for rare stones oh, yeah, usually it's a byproduct of something else right so it becomes uh it's in an old collection it's in an old inventory uh occasionally occasionally yeah you'll get like a road night from brazil uh, a year or so ago there was a mine that was producing and it was it was mostly being mined for specimens but there was also some rough available as well. Okay. So, you know, those those circumstances do arise from time to time. But it, I mean, you know, if somebody wanted to start, say, I'm going to cut, I'm gonna, you know, tomorrow's Monday, I'm going to start cutting rare stones tomorrow morning. It, it, it's a little hard, you know, because the supply is so difficult to come by. Okay, so so it could be challenging. There's some yeah. There's some weirder, but not so rare stones that you could sort of get into that you don't normally see faceted, but the really, like the ones that are really going to demand the, the, the price for the rarity, maybe you're going to get them if they're there, basically. So nobody else is going to be able to get them. Uh, well, yeah, you know, the, the nice thing is, is having the reputation that Coast to Coast has, um, we tend to kind of be, uh, you know, kind of first on the menu for anything that's new to, to be offered to us. Okay that that's that yeah that's lucky so you got well obviously you guys have been there for a long time you you have earned that right basically now um okay so we got a question from the audience uh this is from dennis mcgilvery asking some of the soft stones that you guys facet are too soft for jewelry so are people collecting them like for specimens or or how how are they using a faceted stone that, that couldn't be set yeah i mean certainly some of some of the softer stones can be uh, mounted. Um, very few of them would be would be suggested for rings, but a lot of them would be fine for earrings or pendants or what have you. Um, but you know what? Uh, if it's not, it, people collect everything. People collect stamps. People collect coins. People collect elephants. People collect owls. People collect minerals. People collect gemstones. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of times, uh, many collections will will acquire a rough and cut collection, you know, a rough specimen and a cut collection from a particular locality. And, a, you know, a collection of rough and cut from a variety of localities or even within a within a species can be a tremendous thing. Yeah, that's so cool. Do you ever get a chance to see any of the collectors collections like a display that, that maybe, you know, if someone's been buying from you over the years, if someone has a lot of your material in a really beautiful like museum type thing? Yeah, I mean, a lot of times, a lot of stones that we that we cut, you know, do their do their circuitous route, and some of them end up in private collections that we see later on. Some of them end up in museums that we see later on that you had no idea that was that was there. Mm. Um, a, a funny story that that uh, that I just thought of too when when I was answering that question is, you know, back in the day about setting um, rare stones, uh, Brad uh, Canadian Brad Wilson, he has a uh, a sphalerite earring mm -hmm. and uh, the curious story about that was he joined he joined the group of us back in 1995 i think and i said well brad i said listen i said you know in order for you to be a part of coast to coast um we're all gonna 
you know, uh, we're all going to get earrings. And he said, oh, he says, is that required? And I said, yes. So he showed up in Tucson with a pierced ear and, a, and an earring. He's looking around. He's, well, where are you, where, where's your guy's earrings? I, I, I'm not gonna... <laughs> Does he still wear it? Yeah, he does to this oh, day. Wow, that's cool. So he didn't <laughs> he didn't give in to your guys' uh lack of follow through. Yeah, no, he yeah, he 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 wears it proudly. <laughs> that's cool. That's cool. I mean, yeah, I, I think wearing your own stuff is awesome. I definitely make my own rings yeah. with my own stuff and I'm oh sure. I love it. But... Yeah, and, and and it was some of the soft things you certainly can set. I mean, spalarite you can you can set, um, rotocrosite you can set. I can't set it, but I mean, you know, yeah. a setter that that has the the knowledge to be able to handle some of those soft things definitely can sure yeah. there are some things that will never be set um you know wolfenite will never be set ever yeah. Yeah. um it's just too soft and brittle so if you come across something in a museum that you realize that you've cut and that didn't come from you but came you know through someone else will you kind of go back to the museum and be like by the way we cut this in case you want to have the the provenance or does it matter uh, yeah, in some case, yeah in some cases we do in some cases you know um not not so much i mean the, the smithsonian is actually very very good about you know keeping those records and what have you so if something shows up there that we know of then then you know that's something that they keep in their records for sure that's and cool. other museums do the same as well that's so cool what a cool what a cool legacy and what a cool niche that you guys have built uh you know over the all these decades now it's it's so unusual but it makes sense because of course people love rare anything like you said people collect everything and the rare stuff is you know the weirder the better basically because it's unique well and rare rare is kind of what what rare is to one person is maybe not rare to another or for the particular you know idea that i remember one year in tucson woman came up to our booth and and she's looking and she says uh do you have any any 10 carat unheated yellow sapphires and i said well no i, I said we, we're just really doing you know we're just doing the unusual rare stuff here she said well a 10 carat unheated yellow sapphire is rare and i said well, yeah, okay I'll, I'll give you that but that's not the kind of rare that we have here yeah 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 of course no yeah i guess if you didn't know that there was rare or you know rare minerals it's like yeah well it's hard to get certain things those are rare too right yeah. Um, you know, but yeah, I got it. I, I mean, I'm collecting rare fastening machines, so I totally get it. Nobody else cares. Not too many, at least. Well, even I mean, even some of the the, the rare synthetics. So back in the day, um, Art Art Grant, he was quite friendly with um, uh, just blanked on his name at Bell Labs. Um, uh, I'll think of it. Okay. Anyway, he, they, I mean, Bell Labs, they, they made a tremendous amount of synthetics of a variety of different things for various applications, whether it be government or, or you know, uh, for organizations. And a lot of things, it was just, you know, they made one or two. Mm -hmm. And Art ended up with a lot of that stuff. And when Art passed away, uh, I ended up with a lot of that. So I still have some of the, the real odd ball oh, cool. rarity. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I know a couple of people that collect rare synthetics. So if you're ever going to get rid of some, let me know, because I might have a buyer for you. He's okay. got all kinds <laughs> of weird stuff and he's got normal stuff, too. But yeah, we find sometimes in Bangkok, even we can find some one off rare synthetics because we know some of the manufacturers here. It's, yeah, you find some stuff that there was only seven pieces and then you right. have to get five exactly. of them. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, There's a market for everything. <laughs> so I'm hoping, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm having a leap of faith that COVID has made its biggest um, indentation into, into life and that things are hopefully kind of getting back towards how they once were. Um, what's the future looking like for, for you in your own personal business and also for Coast to Coast? Well, I, you know, I, I like I said, uh, uh, business has never been so good as it has been for the last couple of years. Um, and it really kind of makes sense if you think about it, because uh, at least in the beginning, there, there was no or at least limited travel. There were no sporting events. There were no concerts. There were no shows, theaters, other venues to go to. So a lot of people, you know, kind of went to doing a little bit of retail therapy and and any of the wholesalers were were also, you know, benefit uh, beneficiaries of that success of the retailers. 
And I, I see that at least continuing through this year. Um, I know that you know there's a tremendous um, backlog of, of ships in the Pacific and in the Atlantic that can't unload because they they don't have the the the, the help to do it. Hmm. And so I think the Christmas season this year is going to be a little bit sparse for various items. And I'm hoping the jewelry kind of you know takes the place of some of those things that have to be under the Christmas tree. Yeah. And uh, again, we would be the beneficiaries of that. I think next year Tucson will also be very good um, because it'll be really the first one other than you know any of the deals that we're doing it virtually last year. It'll be the first one in in you know in person. Yeah. Um, you know, Vegas was really the first major show uh, that were that, that was in person and, and, and everybody was just so happy to see one another and, you know, yeah. live and in person that, you know, they could give a hug to. Yeah. Um, so I can't wait. It, you know, you were saying you guys didn't you didn't travel for a few months. We've been in we, we've been in Bangkok for us. You know, when, by the time Tucson happens, it'll be a solid two years of not flying, not doing anything. And, you know, like the lifestyle of pretty much any expat that I know in Bangkok, we always travel, you know, I mean, part of the reason right. we live here so we can travel all the time and, you know, whatever. Yeah. And so for all of us being here for two years, we're just like miserable. Like, man, we don't want to be here for two years. This isn't, this isn't how we thought it was going to be, you know? Yeah. So I, yeah. I can't, me, me and my wife both were just like, we cannot wait to get into Europe, get into America, get into Tucson. Like you said, hopefully give some hugs out or at least some some handshakes or whatever. And yeah, um, definitely. Well, yeah, same anyway, same thing. I mean, I you know my travel has been has been has been a pretty extensive, but it's all been within the country. I I haven't I haven't left the country since yeah. March of 2020. Uh, it's expensive and, you know, to leave the country normally, right now. Yeah, I mean, normally I I'm out seven, eight, nine times a year, and yeah. the last year and a half I haven't been well, outside I, the country. I know Sri Lanka has been hit pretty hard and just consistently, you know, my, my mentors, Sri Lankan, and we're, we're com communicating a lot with the fasting machine manufacturer there and just, they're also booming with orders, but constantly on lockdown. Cause they just keep getting wave after wave of yeah. different COVID hits and, you know, they're a small Island. So it's like yeah. more intense for them. So not easy to get into Sri Lanka at all this year. And then if, of course for us, we can get out of Thailand, no problem, but coming back is really expensive with the quarantine and, you know, it takes weeks and everything like that. So you still have the 14 day quarantine there on, yeah, on coming back. Yeah, it's still yeah. there. It's, yeah. been, it's been on for, you know, a year and three quarters and we're hoping it's going to go off next month, but that's why, yeah, we're leaving for a year in January. So we're just like, okay, don't want to deal with that. We'll just go, <laughs> we'll just keep going around. And then by the time we get back, hopefully it will be over. Hopefully it's, it, or, yeah, no kidding. You no, know, they can't keep it for that. You know, they can't keep it forever. The economy is too, too fragile. So, right. Right. Yeah, we'll, you know, we'll see. But for next year, I'm looking forward to seeing you and everybody else in Tucson. And then, you know, we're going to be traveling all over seeing people. So I'm, I'm looking forward to see you at your house. I'm going to come out to New yeah, Hampshire, sure, definitely. hang out in Boston area. Yeah, and, please do. Uh, yeah. Cool. Well, it's been an awesome conversation. Let me just put up um, the final slide. So if, if people are just discovering you now, or, or maybe if they're just discovering you on YouTube, they'll know <laughs> where to find you. So um, your personal website is johnjbradstraw.com. That's yep. the more the jewelry stones and and jewelry, right? We didn't talk about this, but you're also making and selling some jewelry as well, right? Yeah, you know, in and out of in and out of stores, uh, you know, twice a year for the most part, you know, uh, you know, a store would say, geez, John, it's great to see you again. Uh, but I still have the stones that I bought from you the last time I haven't had a chance to set them up. Do you have anything mounted? Yeah, so you've <laughs> so got begrudgingly, some... I started a small, a small line of finished <laughs> goods as well. And then for the for the for the coast to coast rare stones, rarestone.com. That's easy to remember. Yep. Cool. Yep. Okay, yeah, well, that, that website was been around since the early 90s. So it's been around for a long time. Is it been redesigned since the early 90s? Or is it? Oh, still God, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, it's been redesigned a few times. I want to go back and see the original one. I love when you find those old 1997 websites, you're just like, wow, I remember what it was like. Uh, the first website was pretty much just static. Um, Mike was in charge of kind of doing that. And, and uh, it was it was I mean, it, you couldn't add new items easily or take items away it was pretty much just a, a static page did you guys actually have photos and stuff on there at that time or yep. was it just contact yep. wow yeah no it was, yeah there were photos 
Great. That's so cool. Okay. Well, thank you so much for the time and thanks to the audience. And again, sorry for being a little bit late, but we still got the whole conversation out there, what we wanted to say. Um, so for anybody who's here now, I'm going to be back. So what, this is October now, uh, two more episodes. I'm finishing at the end of the year. So two more to go. Um, and then of course, these are all up on YouTube. Um, John, thank you. I'm going to see you in Tucson and then I'll get, I guess I'll see you later on in, in New England. And, yeah, definitely. Uh, I can't wait. I'm looking forward yeah, to it. Tra travel safe. And, uh, you know, Tucson will be here before we all know it. It's a, it's a short, what, three months or so away. So yeah, yeah. I can't wait. It's so close. So, uh, just have to do a little holidays first and then uh, we can get on over there. Exactly. Cool. So, yep. Thanks to the audience. And for anybody who's looking for me, I'm on the normal social medias. And if you're looking for my book, magusgems.com, uh, we have like 600 books going out this week. And then we're kind of doing the regular orders after that. And there'll be some in Tucson as well. So see you guys out there. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, Justin. See you later, John. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye. Good night to you. You too.